Hello, this is Ed Chapman, and this video cast is the third one in a series on the cell theory. And this video cast is going to focus on how we know microbes do not spontaneously generate. Now, if you remember, um, Francesco Reddy always already showed us that flies don't spontaneously generate, and we already know that Hook and Leeuwenhoek were observing tiny organisms like plant cells and pond organisms and so people just assume that these tiny little creatures could magically appear just spontaneously appear and make food rot and potentially cause diseases and we now know that that's not true uh, microbes like bacteria and fungi and protozoans and algae they don't spontaneously appear they actually come from from other cells that are already alive. So this agrees with what we call the modern cell theory today. So let's, let's try to figure out how this came to be. In 1729, a guy named Lazzaro Spallanzani was born. I believe he was Italian also, and he lived to 1799. All right, so a pretty, pretty respectable lifespan there. And he designed an experiment to figure out why broth spoils. Now, you may have heard this word, broth. Broth is just a name for clear liquid soup with all the goodies strained out. So if you took a chicken or some chicken bones or some vegetables and you just boiled them in water and then you strained out all the solid parts and saved the water, you would have a very simple soup called broth. And broth is highly spoilable. Uh, if you let it cool down and sit at room temperature, it will go sour just like milk will in a remarkably short period of time. So uh, Lazaro Spallanzani was... was was interested in why stuff spoiled, all right, especially stuff like broth. So he was wondering why his soup goes bad. Now, remember, in the 1700s and earlier, there were still a lot of superstitions about why things happened. And one of the superstitions people had was that witchcraft or bad thoughts or being a bad person could make your food spoil or your milk go sour or your broth go bad. And we now know this isn't true. All right, so here's Spallanzani's experiment. Okay, he took some flasks. Okay, a flask is just a flat-bottomed container with a narrow neck that's frequently used in scientific um, situations to heat things. And he put some broth in a flask and he heated it. All right, and then he let it cool and he noticed that a few hours or maybe a day after the broth had cooled, it started getting cloudy. Okay, so this is evidence of microbial growth or bacteria, what we now know to be bacteria, and we say that, that it's spoiling. So this stuff is going to smell really, really bad. Okay, it's going to start stinking. And he also did another trial here where he boiled it and put a cork in it after it had cooled. Okay, I wouldn't, I don't think this drawing is really good here. That cork shouldn't be there. If you heat it with the cork in it, that cork's going to come flying out. But assuming he cor he corked it after it, um, he boiled it after he took it off the fire so that nothing could get in. So this material stayed clean, so nothing could fall in. And he noticed that it doesn't get cloudy. It stays clear. Okay, so this is a really simple experiment. So he had a hypothesis that if you boiled the broth and then you sealed it, it won't spoil. And his experiment showed that this was true. His independent variable was whether or not you sealed it, okay, the cork, and his dependent variable was whether or not it went cloudy or whether it stayed clear. So our, what we were measuring was microbe growth based on cloudiness, okay, and the, the IV was, the independent variable was whether or not you put a cork in the top, okay, so that would make this row up here the control and this the experimental. All right, just real quick there. Uh, here they are down here, just in case you didn't see it. Now, Spallanzani concluded that broth spoils because microbes grow in it, all right, and that you can kill these microbes by boiling the liquid. And if you boil it and it's, there's no living microbes in it, it can't spoil unless new living microbes fall into it. So what Spallanzani was basically saying is that if you have a container, all right, and you put some broth in it, and you boil it, okay, and you get it completely what we now know as sterile, okay, you sterilize it with heat, all right, and then you cap it, all right, what's in here will not go bad. It will stay clean because you are preventing all the germs that are in the air from falling in, all right? So it sounds pretty reasonable to me, okay? So this sounds a lot like third part of the cell theory like we thought like we talked about before that says cells only come from pre-existing cells 
Now, if that's true, that means that microbes can only come from pre-existing microbes. If you kill them, they can't magically come back to life or magically appear. All right, this is what we call biogenesis theory, that life only comes from life. Now, just as Reddy had some problems with his experiments and people accepting them, Spallanzani also had his detractors or his, his enemies, so to speak. And one of the most vocal at the time was a guy named John Needham. And John Needham re rejected Spallanzani's work on religious grounds. Okay? Uh, John Needham uh, suspected scientists of being um, anti-religious, and he didn't like them just you know, right off the bat. But he particularly did not like Spallanzani. And what Needham said is that there was something magical in the air, a life force, if you will, that's needed to bring dead things back to life. So if you seal the container shut, okay, of course it's not going to come back to life. The, the, um, the broth can't spoil because the microbes need air to spontaneously generate. All right. Now, that sounds a lot like witchcraft, but a lot of people still, still thought that way. So I'm hoping by comparing Reddy and Spallanzani, you can see how we have this divide now between two ways of looking at where life comes from. The idea of spontaneous generation and the idea of biogenesis. Okay, now spontaneous generation says that living things can, can sometimes appear in non-living material. Okay, that's what spontaneous generation says. And it's supported by a very long tradition of superstition. And still, even you know, educated people in the 1700s were still thinking along these lines, like Needham. Okay, the biogenesis theory, which is our more modern theory, uh, which is actually part of the cell theory now, says that living things can only come from things that are already alive. All right, not dead, but still alive. And this was supported by the experiments we've talked about already: Reddy's experiment and Spallanzani's experiment. All right. Now the final. Um, nail in the coffin, so to speak, of spontaneous generation was applied by a guy named Louis Pasteur. Uh, Louis Pasteur was kind of like the Ben Franklin of France, uh, probably one of their most famous scientists. And Louis Pasteur lived from 1822 to 1925, so he made it into the 20th century, just barely. And he experimented with a organism that nobody had known about previously. He actually discovered yeasts. And he knew that yeasts are one of the things that can cause broth and milk to spoil. And he proved that microbes cannot spontaneously generate and that there is no vital life force in air that can bring things to life. And it's really important that you understand how he did this. All right? Pasteur did an experiment exactly like Spallanzani's, but he used a very specially shaped flask. All right? If you look here, he made a round bottom flask with a neck that comes up, curves way down, and then curls up at the tip. So it's got a, an S shape, kind of like the neck of a swan or a bird. And most importantly, the neck of the, of the flask is open to the air. So air can move in and out here freely. But any dust or dirt particles cannot go uphill against the force of gravity. They're too heavy. So they're going to collect here in the bottom of this bend. So basically, what Pasteur was able to do is replicate Spallanzani's experiment, but in a way that allows air to move in and out. So if there was a magical life force in air that could bring sterile broth back to life and grow bacteria, then this should spoil, but it did not. It remained clear. All right. So Pasteur's experiment, his IV was whether or not dust or dirt gets to the broth. He was measuring microbial growth by measuring cloudiness, just like Spallanzani did. And his hypothesis was that if the broth is boiled and kept sterile, then it will not spoil. All right? And we remember Louis Pasteur to this day with the word pasteurization. Pasteurization. You probably may have heard this word in connection to milk. Milk has been pasteurized, which all that means is it's been heated up to a temperature that kills all bacteria, so that if you then seal it closed in a container or in a can, for example, it won't spoil. So we kind of honor Louis Pasteur's work to this day by naming this process of heat cleaning or heat sterilization as pasteurization. Okay, so let's review now. We have basically used the work of three different scientists to support number three of the cell theory, that all cells come from pre-existing cells. Reddy and his work with flies, Spallanzani with his early work with broth, 
and Pasteur with his later work with broth and that specially shaped flask. And of course, we're going to cross out Needham here because we now know there is nothing magical about air that can bring things back to life. So, all living things actually do come from pre existing living things, and specifically, cells like bacterial cells and microbes definitely come from pre existing microbes. So, this is the idea behind the theory of biogenesis. Life is generated by life and does not spontaneously appear. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you soon.